to Verbal Diorama, the spookshell bonus episode. <laughs> I'm Em and you know what's coming. I'm excited, you're excited. We're all on probably a sugar high from all the sweets we've consumed so far today. Um, so it's your special Halloween bonus episode and obviously the big news is and the very obvious news is I'm doing TV and not just any TV, literally the best TV because if you're going to mix things up you either go big or go home so I've gone big. If you're a regular listener and wondering where the movies are well we will be returning to them this is just a one-off special if you're completely new to Verbal Diorama and literally only came here because it's a Buffy episode hello big fellow Buffy fan here I, I usually cover movies I'm just doing Hush as a one-off for Halloween, but welcome all the same. And feel free to check out any of the rest of my episodes. And if something floats your boat, then that is awesome. So with this episode specifically, I've been dropping major hints on Twitter for like the last week or so. No one seemed to click. It was Hush. Um, but a couple of people did know I was doing Buffy and specifically Hush because unlike the town of Sunnydale, I can't keep quiet, but thankfully they did. I said things like, I hope you heart emoji it, and seven days to go, and um, it's a little hush hush. I can't say anything about it. Um, so if you got it, but you kept it hush, then well, well done you. But, um, but yeah, I did try and, and drop hints that weren't too obvious. Um, but I would have been really pleased if someone had DM'd me and said, I think you're doing Hirsch. Um, that would have made me really happy, actually. But um, but no one did. So, But if you think you, uh, you got it in the week, then brilliant. Well done you. So this is going to be a little different to a usual episode of Verbal Diorama. Um, I'm not going to be doing any news. I'm not going to be running a trailer because obviously it's a TV show. They didn't have them. Um, there's going to be no obligatory Keanu reference. Um, and I don't usually post spoiler warnings, but I'm gonna. And this is despite the fact that the show has literally been on the air for over 20 years. But spoilers ahead for Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I'm saying this because I know at least two people who are watching it or planning to watch Buffy from the start. So please do not listen unless you want to be spoiled. If you want a recommendation for good Buffy podcasts, both spoiled and unspoiled, I'll be mentioning some I particularly love at the end of this episode. But I repeat, spoiler alert. If you're happy to be spoiled and you're curious about an episode that I personally think is the perfect introduction for a newbie to the show, then feel free to carry on listening. But don't say that I didn't warn you about spoilers. So, Buffy. Specifically Hush. But we are going to talk a little bit about Buffy and where Buffy came from. Very brief synopsis about Hush. So, when everyone in Sunnydale loses their voice, the Scooby gang must silently solve the mystery of the monsters who stole their ability to speak. We'll talk a little bit about the cast and the characters. So, the main cast, we have Sarah Michelle Gellar, who plays Buffy, Nicholas Brendan as Xander, Alison Hannigan as Willow, James Masters as Spike, and Anthony Stewart Head as Giles. Uh, guest starring in this episode were Mark Blucas as Riley, Emma Caulfield as Anya, Leonard Roberts as Forrest, Fina Aruche as Olivia, 
Amber Benson as Tara and Lindsay Krauss as Maggie Walsh and co-starring Doug Jones, Camden Toy, Don W. Lewis and Charlie Brumbley. And if you want to hint who they were playing, well, they were the gentlemen. So there, there is no hint. That's literally it. They were playing the gentlemen. So this particular episode was directed and written by Joss Whedon. Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So Buffy started life as Rhonda the Immortal Waitress. And Rhonda was just a normal woman who seems to be completely ordinary but turns out to be extraordinarily skilled. Um, so this was Joss Whedon's idea. It morphed into the inversion of the Hollywood trope of the blonde girl who runs into a dark alley and is the first to be killed. Um, Joss Whedon specifically wanted to make her the hero. Um, and I talked a little bit about Buffy specifically in Cabin in the Woods because obviously that was also written by Joss Whedon. Um, so the idea for Buffy was developed into a script for the 1992 movie Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which starred Christy Swanson as Buffy, along with Donald Sutherland as her watcher Merrick, Rutger Hauer, the late Rutger Hauer, as the villain Lothos, and again, the late Luke Perry as her love interest Pike. Um, so Joss Whedon wasn't happy that the movie was more of a comedy than a horror because he intended it to be a horror. And it was the director, Fran Rubel Kazooie, who gradually made the movie more comedic in tone. And Whedon, who was just the writer, had zero creative control over the character that he created. So he just basically had to sit back and watch it happen. Um, and he's gone on record to say he's not keen. Um, for the record, I think Buffy the Vampire Slayer as a movie, I think it's really disjointed. Um, I think it's overly goofy, um, but I also think it's a lot of fun. And I remember actually really fondly. Um, so if you've not seen the movie, I would say give it a chance because I think you'll find something to enjoy, even if it is just Luke Perry. And Luke Perry is actually really good in the movie. And so is Rutger Hauer. And when Rutger Hauer passed away uh, quite recently, um, his role as Lothos was really the first introduction I ever had to Rutger Hauer as an actor. So I really love the movie for actually introducing me to, to him specifically. I'm not going to dwell on the movie because that's not why we're here. So five years after the movie, he created a pilot of the TV show of the same name, which is considerably more highly acclaimed and respected than aforementioned movie. It was originally a mid-season replacement, which is why the first season is only 12 episodes long. And he had the idea of it being based on the principle of high school is hell. Um... Interestingly, the original script of the movie that Joss Whedon wrote and not the movie itself, because, as I've said, he's basically disowned it. So that original script is considered canon in the Buffyverse. So Buffy the Vampire Slayer really revolutionised TV format. It had its overarching big bad of each season and it also had individual monsters of the week. Um, and the individual monsters of the week were not necessarily linked to the overall big bad. Sometimes they were, but generally they weren't. Um, and the influence of Buffy spans multiple genres and many different TV shows, including, most famously, the revival of Doctor Who. And it's also partially credited with the creation of the website tvtropes.org. And if anyone's ever been on TV Tropes, I mean, that is just a rabbit hole of really fascinating and interesting bits of trivia and tropes. And it's it's just absolutely wonderful. They don't just do TV, they do movies as well. Um, and uh, I highly recommend, uh, if you've got a couple of hours to spare, go on TV Tropes and those couple of hours will just fly by. Um, but yeah, so that site actually started uh, primarily because of Buffy. Um, Buffy had seven seasons, it had 144 episodes, it had its own spin-off in Angel and it continues as comic books and the cast are still very active, they still do cons and the show itself is still continually finding an audience. The fact that Buffy can continually resonate with people 20 plus years after it first aired is absolutely phenomenal and um, yeah, Buffy's amazing. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm hoping that you're listening to this because you love Buffy. But if you've never seen an episode of Buffy before, I mean, in the UK, it's available on Amazon Prime. Um, so if you have an Amazon Prime subscription, please go and check out Buffy. All seven seasons are on Amazon Prime. It's absolutely wonderful. I'm going to move on from talking about Buffy in general. There's so much I could talk about with Buffy. But I'm mindful that A, it's a bonus episode, and B, it's an episode about Hush. So, 
let's talk about Hush. And I'm not going to be quiet <laughs> when I'm talking about Hush. So Hush is the 10th episode of season four. It actually aired on December the 14th, 1999. So this episode is literally almost 20 years old, which is incredible. Um, season four of Buffy had the show essentially soft rebooted from high school to a college setting. So Buffy enrolls at the fictional UC Sunnydale alongside Willow, while Xander eschews college for the world of work. And Giles begins to feel less and less like Buffy's watcher and sort of a bit more despondent with what he's got going on. And then you had existing supporting characters like Anya and Spike. They get a bit more to do. And we get new characters like Riley Finn and Tara McClay. So Tara especially is a very important character for the show going forward. Riley is, um, well, he's good looking. I think the general overall consensus is that most people see season four as a bit of a mixed bag. It's got some of the best episodes the show's done, um, including Hush, obviously. But I'm also going to list a couple of others that I think are really, really good. Um, so there's A New Man, um, This Year's Girl and Who Are You, which was like a two-parter. And also Restless, which is probably one of the most famous episodes of Buffy, along with one of my personal favourites, Something Blue. So Something Blue was the uh, preceding episode before this one. And it was also the precursor to The Brilliance, that is... Spuffy. But again, I'm not going to go into that. If you're interested in what Spuffy is, do a search on the internet. It'll tell you everything you need to know. So why am I covering Hush on Halloween? Well, obviously it's scary, but you could be asking me, well, why aren't you doing a Halloween episode of Buffy? And you'd be right, because there are plenty of Halloween based episodes. But canonically, the demons and the vampires tend to stay home on Halloween. And also, they're great episodes, but they're not really scary. I would argue that Hush is scary. Um, well, scary, scary enough. But not only that, Hush is a technical marvel. Um, from its writing to its cinematography, its music, um, the makeup, the special effects. And everything kind of delivers this humour and sincerity and horror sort of in this beautifully little neat package time and money were lavished on Hush and you can tell it's special and the reason why you can tell it's special is it has a written and directed by Joss Whedon credit and Joss didn't waste time on mediocre episodes so in season four he wrote and directed four episodes and they were The Freshman, Hush, Who Are You and Restless and the reason he wrote Hush in the first place was he was bored of critics saying that Buffy was only as good as its dialogue. And the idea of having an episode devoid of any sort of vocal work and just relying on the visuals and physicality actually really frightened him. Um, originally, he planned to have a musical episode this season, but just happened that Xena Warrior Prince had, had just done one. So he put that idea on ice until season six. But we're not going to talk about that as much as I want to. I'm not going to. When Joss Whedon was a child, he had a nightmare about floating monsters. And that's where the kind the idea of the gentleman came from. So the gentlemen were modelled on these classic horror cinema characters like Pinhead and Nosferatu, and also Mr. Burns from The Simpsons. So these kind of ghoulish tall figures fashioned as elegant, graceful, Victorian-styled men who are always incredibly polite in their demeanour to each other with these wide gaping grins that are fixed to their faces and um, the minions who were called footmen they collect the specimens required for the gentleman to silently and viciously pluck the hearts of the chest of the seven victims um, which is representative of the class and the patriarchy of Victorian society as in the footmen are essentially the the minions and the slaves. Um, they feel to me very reminiscent of Renfield in the story of Dracula and um, you know what's a great Dracula movie? Um, Bram Stoker's Dracula. And um, you know who stars as Jonathan Harker? But I said I wasn't going to, so I'm not. Sorry, Keanu. The gentlemen themselves were played by professional mimes and physical actors, and they were led by Doug Jones. Um, if you don't know who Doug Jones is, you will know who Doug Jones is. He's a man that I'm very, very incredibly fond of because of his amazing physicality and um, physical work but mainly with the director Guillermo del Toro 
Um, so Doug Jones played the fawn amongst many other characters in Pan's Labyrinth. He was Abe Sapien in the two Del Toro Hellboy movies and most recently the Amphibian Man in The Shape of Water. So notably Camden Toy, who played one of the other gentlemen, he worked on other monsters in the Buffyverse. So he played season seven's Narl. Um, and if you uh, recall the episode with Narl, um, that is disgusting. <laughs> that is an absolutely disgusting character. But I'm not going to talk about it. Um, and he also played the Uber Vamp in several episodes as well. So the motions of the gentleman had to be fluid and graceful. Um, and they achieved it by essentially being suspended by cranes um, to float. They also were pulled along on dollies as well to get sort of that similar effect. The makeup of the gentleman was done by John Vulick and Todd McIntosh, and it's flawless. Um, I mean, you just look at those faces. <laughs> they are absolutely petrifying. I don't know what it is about things that smile like that. It's really scary. But to be honest, the makeup and the effect just, yet yeah, again, denotes the absolute perfection achieved by practical effects and makeup in just how realistically terrifying the gentlemen are. I mean, imagine CGI gentlemen for a second. They sound ridiculous. I can't imagine it. I can't imagine why, how. It's just ridiculous. The effort that went into making the episode suggests that they knew they had something special. So entire sets were built and lit just for shots that lasted a few seconds. And from what I've read about the TV industry specifically, they will not do that because they want to get as much use out of all of that work to build that set and light it. They don't do that for a shot that lasts a couple of seconds. The clock tower itself, so the clock tower that the gentleman and the footman are in, um, was purposely built at the Universal Studios lot for that final fight sequence where Buffy and Riley face off against the, the gentleman and the footman. And the scene where Buffy finally gets her voice back and screams, not Sarah Michelle Gellar's actual scream either, it was dubbed, um, where the gentleman's heads blow up, so that was one long shot, but it took an hour to film. So just the sheer level of skill and time and love that went into this episode is just apparent. So the episode is famous for hardly having any dialogue in it at all. Um, the episode's reliance on speech stops at the 14 minute three second mark. And overall, there's only 17 minutes of dialogue in the whole episode. Um, and the wordless parts are scored by just stunning music which is specifically designed to narrate and that is the music that was composed by Christoph Beck if you listen to Edge of Tomorrow I stuck a pin in um, Christoph Beck and Buffy and this is the reason why because I wanted to talk specifically about the genius of Christoph Beck um, he scored seasons two to four of Buffy but he did come back uh, for special episodes so he came back for the gift and for Once More with Feeling. Um, and if you're a Buffy fan, then you know how special both of those episodes are. Um, one of the funniest parts of this whole episode is Giles's overhead projector presentation, um, which is set to Camille Sansane's Dance Macabre, which I hope I pronounced correctly, um, which kind of gives it this spooky yet jolly subtext um, because essentially Hush pays homage to the silent movies and obviously silent movies generally used music to tell the story and elicit the emotion that you would normally get from speech. And where Hush is concerned, the emotion it elicits is just mainly pure terror because nothing is scarier than not being able to vocalise your terror with a scream. It's just completely chilling to watch the young man at the start when he's being held down by the footman. He's trying desperately to scream, or to make a noise, to get someone, you know, anyone to help and he can't make a noise. And then he gets his heart cut out. It's absolutely petrifying because the power of speech and language is an incredible thing. I mean, you're listening to me with my power of speech and language. Well, I'm not sure it's a power, but OK. Um, but you're listening to a podcast and part of a podcast is the deliverance of something by speech um, and by language. And for that, a podcast needs both. But what Hush does so well is it 
deals with the limitations of language when communicating in that sometimes language isn't enough that sometimes when you have everything to say you say nothing and when you can't say nothing you say everything and it shows us how much as well we take the ability for speech for granted and how easy it would become to be isolated without the power of speech The episode also speaks of human nature, the human nature to try and get commercial gain from a catastrophe, as witnessed by the guy who's immediately selling overpriced whiteboards um, pretty much as soon as no one can speak. And also how quickly society will descend into chaos, because, again, pretty immediately people start fighting, they start looting. Um, It's almost like people can't cope with this lack of speech. Each character as well um, of the main cast, before the gentlemen steal the voices of the town, they all have things to say to each other. Specifically when we're talking about uh, Buffy and Riley. So they're obviously not really telling each other how they feel. They're keeping stuff back. And this episode is obviously a bit of a turning point for them to finally realise who each other actually is. Xander is not able to express how much Anya means to him. So she just thinks that She's essentially, uh, I'm not going to swear, but a sex buddy. Um, And language in this sort of first part of the episode is not used to actually express any proper real human emotion. So all the characters are essentially doing is just kind of talking to each other. They're talking, but they're not communicating. And there's a big difference between talking and communicating. Um, And they just kind of blabber on incessantly and I get the irony of that because that is exactly what I'm doing right now um (laughs) so Hush is also primarily known for its jump scares and what it does is it uses the newly introduced characters in the episode so we've got two characters that are introduced in this episode we have Tara and we have Olivia so they're used as essentially the audience stand-ins for that kind of jump scare and the fear and essentially the heart pounding realization that if you're chosen um, then you're probably going to get your heart ripped out by a scalpel but it's all done without this reliance on the snappy dialogue that Buffy the Vampire Slayer is so known for Buffy as a show is known for its like Buffy speak it's witty quick dialogue um, and this episode has to do without all of that so what it does is it communicates in other ways. So specifically, it communicates with gestures um, and with obviously facial expressions and looks. And by doing so, it actually becomes one of the funniest episodes of the whole series by far because a lot of these gestures are completely misunderstood and a lot of them are quite rude which is wonderful because everyone loves rude gestures Buffy basically looks like she's referencing a hand job she's not she's talking about staking Spike sticks up two fingers to Xander to basically tell him to uh, bugger off and um, Anya's sex gesture which apparently is um, the network were not too happy (laughs) with that gesture But they were just like, well, it's literally the best episode you've ever done, Joss, so we'll let you have it. Um, But again, talking about sort of silent movies and and what it does to kind of uh, be reminiscent of silent movies is it really is reminiscent of this kind of slapstick silent movie comedy or something like that. It does it so well. The Gentlemen, going back to The Gentlemen, so they are obviously fictional. But within the canon of Buffy, they are based on a fairy tale. So Giles picks up a book of fairy tales and this is where he finds out the fairy tale of the gentleman. And they are probably the scariest monsters of the week to ever appear on Buffy. And in order to kill them, you need to scream. And especially the fairy tale specifically mentions that the princess um, needs to scream. Um, But obviously Buffy who is the princess of the story, she very validly asks, well, how do I get my voice back? How do I scream? It's really interesting as well, because when we're talking about fairy tales, a lot of the time in fairy tales, women were heroes. And Buffy as a character and Buffy as a show has always spoken to these societal norms of how we see female characters and this kind of gender reversal of the trope of the man always being the hero. 
And specifically in Buffy, um, the most powerful characters in the show are female. So we have Buffy herself, who's the slayer. She's literally the chosen one. Um, Willow, who at this point is learning about becoming a wicker. She's going to like a wicker group, but she's not fully yet kind of established her witch powers. She even says, you know, I can spin a pencil, but that's kind of it. Anya, she doesn't have any powers per se, but she has this kind of wealth of knowledge because she's a centuries old ex-demon. And we have the introduction of Tara as well. And Tara's really interesting because it's her union with Willow that produces this immense power. And so it's a power that neither of them had individually and they come together in that one special scene um, and manage to kind of block the door by using this power. Whenever I cover movies, I always like to look at awards, especially if it's a movie that I feel was snubbed specifically. And where Buffy is concerned, it was snubbed a lot. Um, and I think that's mainly because of the genre of TV show it was. So when we're talking about um, awards, obviously the biggest award in TV in America is probably the Emmys. So Hush specifically was nominated for two Emmys. So in the year 2000, it was nominated for Outstanding Cinematography for a Single Camera Series and Outstanding Writing for a Drama Series. Um, it also had several other nominations over the years. Um, but when it came to winning Emmys, um, because by the way, it never had any awards nominations for any of the acting, which is actually quite a travesty because Sarah Michelle Gellar is absolutely outstanding in this show, as is Alison Hannigan. I think the two of them are just amazing. But it was never nominated for any acting categories. Um, but the only two Emmys it ever won were Outstanding Makeup for a series, which was for the two-parter Surprise and Innocence, and Outstanding Music Composition for a series brackets a dramatic underscore for becoming part one so surprise and innocence and becoming part one they were both season two episodes so really the only emmy award winning season is season two um which is a great season to be honest but it did get quite viciously snubbed um as far as awards go uh, which is really sad because i think it really really deserved to get more recognition than it ever did. It has some really, really great episodes. Buffy the Vampire Slayer was groundbreaking in so many ways, but mainly how it took the fantastical, the mythical and the demonic, and it kind of grounded them into these real and recognisable human situations. The thing that I love most about Buffy is that whilst none of us are slayers, or indeed could be slayers in this particular world, we always think that we could, if that were real, that we could have that power, that we could stand up and we could be the chosen one. Um, and that is the true genius of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. It's especially interesting and brilliant and important that even though it's a show that's over 20 years old and sometimes it can feel a little bit dated um, especially when we're talking about on screen technology um, I would say it's a show that is still relevant today in so many ways um, and I think the main lesson we can take from an episode like Hush is when the bad guys attempt to silence you you must scream. This is normally the part of Verbal Diorama where I say, oh, I've had some comments on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook or whatever, because I normally ask for people's general thoughts about whatever I'm covering. But obviously I didn't tell anyone specifically that I was doing A, a Buffy episode, or B, Hush. So there are none. Um, there are no social media thoughts this time. But um, I wanted to do a bit of an experiment because I've always said that I believe Hush is the best episode to give 
a non-Buffy fan for them to kind of get into Buffy because I feel like it's an episode that you can enjoy regardless of sort of how you feel. Um, and thankfully, I had a guinea pig because I was chatting to Andy from Geek Salad and he mentioned to me that he watched a couple of episodes of season one of Buffy and it wasn't really for him. He was like, I understand why people love it, but the show isn't for me, I don't think. Um, so I said to him, well, I'm doing a season four episode for Halloween. Have a watch of it. See what you think and let me know. And I said, I'll put it in the episode so that everyone can listen to what you think. So and because Andy is literally one of the nicest guys, he was really keen. So here's Andy with his thoughts on Hush. Hey, Verbal Diorama. Hi, Em. This is Andy from the Geek Salad Podcast. Um, Em asked me to do something a little special. In fact, a bit of an experiment. Um, About a week or two ago, I had mentioned that several of my cohorts on my own podcast, Geek Salad, as well as some friends and some people on our social media, had essentially been bullying me to watch Buffy the Vampire Slayer, um, a show that I had really no interest in watching when I was 25 years old when it first premiered and essentially just never got around to watching. So I did watch a few episodes and let my feelings known to M that I can understand why people like it. It's just that um, where I am now and where I was in 1997 when it first came out, I don't feel like the show itself was especially for me. Um, but I can I can definitely understand why people just love it. So M charged me with an experiment. Uh, that experiment is to watch the season four, episode 10 episode entitled Hush. I have to admit that I actually really enjoyed this episode. Um, not enough to keep me on the Buffy bandwagon, but as a standalone episode, I really enjoyed it. I loved that there was no dialogue. I, th- I, I kind of feel like in a lot of cases with uh, Buffy, at least, again, in my own opinion, that it tries to be a little too cute with its its dialogue and its repartee. And I know a lot of people love that about Buffy. I'm not one of those people. Uh, so finding an episode where everything has to be done through a lot of hand gestures, not even sign language, just hand gestures, was really interesting. And a lot of the humor was called out of visual gags. Um, There is a great thing where Giles is using an overhead projector and saying what he's learned about the gentleman. And one of the things is the drawing of Buffy. And Buffy looks at it and spaces out her hands wider about the hips that Giles had drawn for her. And it was, it was really funny. Um, Overall, I I really, I did enjoy the episode primarily because I, I love the concept of the, of the hush gentlemen. The ghouls are super cool. Uh, big, wide, toothy grins. Just, it's just some really fun stuff. The, the one thing I found a little bit silly about the episode, and it's not a knock on the episode itself, it's just that their henchmen who were in the, uh, the straight jackets really came off as being like Halloween City type of costume ghoulishness that they're just trying to make to make it look scary <laughs> and I um, I just found that it, it, it just, I don't know it was a bit distracting considering that they're the ones that get all the action in the movie while uh, Buffy and friends dispatched of them so um, my overall rating for Hush uh, is three and a half stars out of four um, for, for a series that I'm not not really into I do I do like this episode a lot and I do thank you M for for suggesting that one to me so at least I've got I I can't say that it's like I unequivocally hate Buffy I don't even unequivocally hate Buffy I just I really enjoyed this episode in particular and I'm willing to check other like very special episodes if uh, there are any otherwise um 
that's that's it for me. I'm Andy from Geek Salad, and thank you very much, M, and the audience of Verbal Diorama for hearing me out uh, about Hush. Have a great day. Thank you. So, thank you so much, Andy, for your thoughts on Hush. It appears that I didn't succeed in converting Andy to a seasoned Buffy fan, um, but no big deal. People like what they like. I'm really glad that A, he enjoyed Hush because I was a little bit worried that he'd turn around and say that he hated it. And then I was going to go, but Andy, you've completely ruined my episode now. Um, So I'm really glad that he enjoyed it. Um, And also, I think it's really important that he was honest with his thoughts. And because if you don't like something, that is absolutely fine. You can't expect to like everything. And just because you like something, you can't expect everyone else to like it too. So... I am all for Andy giving us his honest opinion. There are definitely other episodes that we can recommend to you, Andy. So uh, I will probably be sliding into your DMs very soon with some others that I think that you might enjoy. There's one specific one that pops into my immediate mind. But, um, But yeah, I guess we shall see whether Andy will like other episodes of Buffy as well. Hmm. And he's going to be back next episode because he's going to be guesting on the show for real. And I'm hoping that he's going to like what we're going to be talking about next episode a little bit more because the movie that we're going to be covering next episode is Mystery Men from 1999. So again, about the same age as this episode is. Thank you for listening to this very special episode of Verbal Diorama on Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Um, let me know your favourite episode of Buffy at Verbal Diorama on like Twitter, Instagram or Facebook. So you can find me, follow me and talk Buffy to me whenever. Like I am more than happy to talk about Buffy to anyone. And if you like this episode or just Buffy in general, here's a, a list of some Buffy podcasts that I love. And ones that I would highly recommend. So, um, Buffy podcasts that are currently ongoing, there are two that I listen to, and they are Buffering the Vampire Slayer, and they are currently going through season five. And most importantly, Buffering the Vampire Slayer is spoiler free. So, you can start listening from the top, from season one, episode one, and those ladies are completely spoiler free. And another one that's ongoing is Still Pretty. That is currently on season four. I think they're actually doing a Hush episode around about now. I'm sure their Hush episode is going to be miles better than mine. But they are fully spoiled. So if you are happy to be fully spoiled on Buffy or you've watched all of Buffy, then listen to Still Pretty. They are fabulous. Um some podcasts that have finished um but are still worth kind of having a look into there's one called the sunnydale stacks there's also one called tiny fences and a really really old one which is the first one of the first podcasts i ever started listening to actually is one called the buffy rewatch so those are some buffy podcasts that i would recommend obviously if there are any buffy podcasts that you would specifically recommend for me to listen to um then please let me know if you've got a Buffy podcast that you love, that I can love as well. That would be awesome. But otherwise, thank you for listening. And hopefully I will see you next time for Mystery Men. But here's a question to kind of finish the episode off. What would have happened if the gentleman got all seven hearts? Let me know. Bye. Move it, you know.